Hey, I'll just uh, tell you, the last few weeks here at Village, we've been looking at this series, Got Questions. We've, we've looked at the subject a couple of weeks ago of justice and suffering. Uh, we then had a week on hell and judgment. Uh, we looked at the Bible and the place of the Bible. And now today, patriarchy, uh, questions that people in our suburb, in our district have asked us to look at. Uh, we did a survey late last year. And so that's what next week we're um, getting into praying like Jesus. It's a new series. Uh, We're going to be looking at uh, John chapter 17 over three weeks. Uh, We're going to look at Jesus' prayer for himself, Jesus' prayer for his friends, and then Jesus' prayer for the world. But also next week, we're going to be baptizing some friends on uh, Sunday morning, Uh, some friends who come to trust Jesus for the first time uh, over the last few months, uh, and uh, we're going to be having the pleasure, the joy of uh, baptizing them and welcoming some of their friends and family uh, to join us here in church. Let us pray, and then we'll look at the Word of God and think about this question that's been assigned to us this morning. Our Father God, we pray that amongst all the other stuff going on, you'd help us to hear your voice this morning. We pray that um, I attempt to answer this question. Um, You'd help us to think critically and well about these important issues and this important intersection uh, between what your scripture says and what the world says and just to think sharply and well and to, to be prepared um, to listen to you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the biggest TV series of the last two years across the West has been The Handmaid's Tale. Margaret Atwood's 1985 novel, a series based on that, has won five Emmys. It's about a United States taken over by religious fundamentalism where women are oppressed and subservient. It's a brutally oppressive patriarchy. Gay men are hanged. Birth control pills are not allowed. Most women have become infertile. And so those young women who are fertile are taken as handmaids to be impregnated by a commander. They are wombs on two legs. The script is packed with Bible quotes, biblical language and names. Regular words like hello and goodbye have been replaced by creepy pieties like under his eye and blessed be the fruit. There's one scene early on where the music from Onward Christian Soldiers is played as the master reads from the Bible and then has sex with a handmaid while his wife is present watching this rape. That is the patriarchal culture of the handmaid's tale. And my suspicion is that when someone, maybe not you, but someone unfamiliar with the Christian Bible asks the question that's put to us today, Does the Bible reflect a patriarchal bias or does God treat men and women equally? They're kind of asking how much of the handmaid's tale is true? And there's a complexity because large parts of Australia now know so little about the Bible that people actually get their Bible knowledge from shows like The Handmaid's Tale. And they might end up thinking a phrase like that gets quoted and quoted and quoted, blessed be the meek, which Jesus actually did say and is repeated again and again in The Handmaid's Tale and is used as a way to control the handmaids and it's used to justify abuse and used to justify silencing and it's used along with electric cattle prods to punish women when they don't comply. And people say, how much of The Handmaid's Tale is true? Because if that's the Christian God and that's the kind of patriarchy he's for, then I don't want him. Okay, fictional story. You then look over to the real United States, and you have a situation in the real United States where Christian leaders, so people like Franklin Graham, have pretty much unequivocally backed President Trump and backed him and backed him despite his bad behaviour 
which is every bit as bad as the Me Too guys. Now, in saying that, I'm not talking about policy, I'm not talking about whether there should be walls, I'm not talking about Democrats in Congress or anything like that. I'm talking about what Mr. Trump said in the taped exchange with Billy Bush from Access Hollywood. I mean, when, it was, when the tape came out, Billy Bush was sacked by NBC, but the transcript, in the video, Trump discusses a failed attempt to seduce Bush's then co-host, Nancy O'Dell. This is Trump. I moved on her. I failed. I admit it. I did try and F her. She was married. Goes on. He talks about, as it is a star, groping women. You just kiss, and when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. You grab them by the... Franklin Graham urged Christian voters to overlook Trump's crude remarks about grabbing women's genitals and about Mr. Trump's adultery with porn star Stormy Daniels. Franklin Graham's gone on record as saying it happened 12 years ago before he was president. It's nobody's business. I say to those US Christian leaders, if you lie down with rats, you wake up with fleas. What they've done is confused people on the subject of what is Jesus, on the subject of what is the gospel, on the subject of what is the Bible's posture towards women. What is the Bible's teaching attitude towards women? It is awful for a woman to be mistreated by a man. But it is an awful, rock-bottom, despicable awful for a woman to be mistreated by a man and have it somehow communicated to her that God approves. It makes me sick. It makes me want to cry. It makes me angry. It makes me furious that people have so wickedly twisted the word of God to justify that. I'm so, so sorry. I want to call them out and stand up and say that it is dreadful and not Christian. Um, here we are, got questions, and we have this question. Does the Bible reflect a patriarchal bias, or does God treat men and women equal? That's the question that was put to us. So firstly, just in terms of getting our head around it, I've printed it on the outline. There's an outline. You want to follow what I'm going to say here. We're going to move very fast this morning, and I need to think sharply with me. Um, We've got a, if you go to my.villagechurch.sydney, there's an electronic outline if you want to take notes there. But if you're taking paper notes, the handout sheet, does the Bible reflect a patriarchal bias or does God value men and women equally? First question, what is patriarchy? Here's a definition from dictionary.com. A form, a noun, a form of social organisation in which the father is the supreme authority in the family, clan or tribe and descent is reckoned in the male line with the children belonging to the father's clan or tribe. A society, community or country based on this social organisation, a social system in which power is held by men through cultural norms and customs that favour men and withhold opportunity from women. Now, just as we do this, here's a presupposition that I'm working from that I just wanted to be transparent about. And actually, it's not just me here, it's... Um, if you t this won't do any good to anyone watching on live stream, but if you are in the room here, you can see that poster in the back in the corridor there. It, the poster is of the 39 articles of Christian religion from uh, 1562. The bishops of the church agreed. And Article 20 of the Church of England states that it is not lawful for the church to ordain anything contrary to God's written word, and neither may it expound one place of scripture that be repugnant to another. The idea behind that is that God who caused the scripture to be come into existence, God breathed the scripture, he had a view, he had a mind, he had a consistent view. And so when I teach the Bible, I mustn't teach this bit in such a way that it contradicts that bit, because it doesn't, because God said it all, and he is consistent. And so I just want you to, you know, I want to establish from the first principles of the Bible what God's position on men and women is, and then we'll see, well, other verses need to fit in with that framework. So I'm on page one of the Bible. Page one, very beginning of creation. And in verse 26 of chapter one of Genesis, God said, 
Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They'll rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God creates men and women. We come from God. We're made by God. We bear a resemblance to God. We are, we as men and we as women, we together bear the image of God. To image God, it's to mirror his holiness. Humanity is unique in this. We find our identity upward towards God, not downwards towards the animals. We have a special calling over the animals. We are to rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth. Humanity is to rule the earth under God. Together, male and female are given that commission by God to be ruling lower creation. Humanity is created as royalty in God's world. Male and female alike bearing the divine image, the divine glory. On the opening page of the Bible, men and women are created as equal, joint, divine image bearers. So I look at the question, does the Bible reflect a patriarchal bias or does God value men and women equally? And my answer is whatever is said about the first part of the sentence, the second part of the sentence, men and women are created equal, are valued equal. Your value as a person does not come from what you do. Your value as a person comes from the fact that you are made in God's image and if you're a woman, you're made in God's image. If you're a man, you're made in God's image. Just, there's a paradox though. In the creation account as it goes on, Genesis 1 teaches the equality of the sexes as God's, God's image bearers on earth. But in Genesis 2, there is another complex dimension. For the two do not have undifferentiated sameness there is a beautiful, profound distinction between men and women. I'm following Raymond Ortland here. I am not just a human, I am a man. You're not just a human, you're a woman. God wants men to be men and women to be women and the two are given different roles and responsibilities. And look, the crucial, ver we, we had this read for us by Miriam a moment ago. Let me just look, lock her eyes on Genesis 2 and the passage she read to us. And, and, and it, it's almost like a, a second camera angle of creation. I'll, I'll take it from 2.7. The Lord God formed the man. And we're in the Garden of Eden. The Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground, breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. The man became a living being. Now, the man's task is to develop the garden and guard the garden. Verse 15, the Lord took the man, placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. He, he's commanded not to eat from one particular tree. Um, he can enjoy all the others, but one he's not to. Uh, or there'll be a judgment or a punishment. 16, the Lord commanded the man... 2.16, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat of it, you'll certainly die. We see here from God a phenomenal generosity, a clear moral responsibility for the man. Anything you like, except that. And there's a defined boundary for him to live within. And then God announces within this stunning perfection of the Garden of Eden that there is something wrong. Verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. God puts his finger on the deficiency in paradise and God pronounces a solution. I will make a helper corresponding to him. Surprisingly, God doesn't immediately create the helper. Instead, he parades the animals. 20, the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. Oh, just incidentally, if you're new with us, we'll have a time of questions and comments at the end if we've got time. So save those up for the end. 21, the first surgical operation. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Place. 
Bortland notes the creator goes to work, opening the man's side, removing a rib, closing a wound, making a woman, 22. The Lord God made the rib he'd taken from the man into a woman, brought her to the man, and there she stands. Wonderful. Uniquely suited to compliment him. As if the man, God says to the man, wake up. There's one more creature, son. I'd like to know what you think here. And the response of the man in 23, ecstatic delight. The man said, this one at last. He's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman. For she was taken from man. And these are the first recorded human words. And they are poetry. Of all the creatures, she meets my needs. She compliments me. She is my equal, my very flesh. I identify with her. I love her. I'm going to call her woman. For she was taken from man. And then the statement, 24 and 25, which is actually the key to understanding marriage, but, but which we don't have time to dwell on this morning, sadly. But I do want to dwell on this phrase in 18 and 20, a helper corresponding to him. Out of all the creatures in this close-up second view of creation, the woman corresponds to the man. She alone is Adam's equal. She is welcomed as his equal, bone of bone, flesh of flesh, he says. She's the same as him. A man may enjoy companionship with an animal, but only on an animal's terms only on the animal's level, but with a wife. A man can enjoy companionship on his level for she is his equal. And she can enjoy companionship on her level for he is her equal. But then this word helper, she is created to help him rather than her to, rather than him to help her. Man and woman are equal and yet there's a differentiation he is to work to garden and protect the garden and she is to help him. Is this an insult to women? Is this a threat to women? No. Woman is just as gifted as man with all the attributes required for attaining wisdom, righteousness and life. I found as I explored this it helpful to note the other occurrences of the word helper in the Bible. I'll put them up on the screen. There's about 15 of them. We're going to just go through them very fast. One, first one, Exodus 18.4. And the other, Eliza, because he'd said, the God of my father was my helper and rescued me from Pharaoh's sword. I, just, just as I read these out, just think, who is the helper in each of these verses as I read them out? Who is the That's the question you're, you're answering. Psalm 10.14. You yourself have seen trouble and grief, observing it in order to take the matter into your hands. The helpless one entrusts himself to you. You are a helper of the fatherless. That's a prayer to God. Um, Psalm 27.9. Do not hide your face to me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me, God of my salvation. Or, or, or Psalm 30 verse 10. Lord, listen and be gracious to me. Lord, be my helper. Or Psalm 40, verse 17, I'm oppressed and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my helper and my deliverer. My God, do not delay. Or 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, our helper who's always found in times of trouble. Or Psalm 54, 4, God is my helper. Or Psalm 63, 7, you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. Or, or Psalm 72, 12, he'll rescue the poor who cry out and the afflicted who have no... You read through the Bible looking for the word helper. Almost every occurrence of the word helper, the one who is the helper is God. The vast majority of cases, just, I just want to be very, very clear on this. To be a helper is not to be less than. You got that? Man and woman are equal. Given different roles and responsibilities, and just as God takes on the role of helper, when God helps, he retains his deity, but steps into the helping role. Now, okay, oh, Old Testament, come to New Testament. I come to the New Testament, what's the role of husbands? What's the role of wives in, in the biblical picture? Well, Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5.25. 
husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy. The the word love appears six times in this little section on husbands and wives. It is the husband's duty to love. Husbands, you are to love, like Christ. The character and description of the husband's love for the wife is to be modelled on Christ, on Jesus. The husband is to give himself in the way that Jesus gave himself, sacrificial, beneficial to the bride, to his wife. Jesus laid down his, the line 28, 28, in the same way husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church. There's a tenderness. The emotionally evocative words of nurture of keeping warm, of cherishing, of comforting, of looking after, and in response. 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He's the saviour of the body as the church submits to Christ, so wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. She, She is secure in his love in his tenderness, that he is for her, that he will always act for her good, she can trust him. She can trust him with her all, to have a confidence that he won't exploit her, that he will always want her best and always act for her best. In this model, this biblical model, where men and women are equal and yet different responsibilities, different roles? Are women oppressed? Do the women of the Bible look like the women of the Handmaid's Tale? Not at all. Not at all. Nothing like it. There are so many outstanding Old Testament women, so many outstanding New Testament women. I mean, I'm thinking of Esther. Let me introduce you to the woman admired by King Lemuel in Proverbs 31. Who can find a wife of noble character? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will not lack anything good. She rewards him with good and not evil all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from far away. She rises while it's still night, provides food for her household, portions for her female servants. She evaluates a field and buys it. She plants a vineyard with her earnings. She draws on her strength and reveals that her arms are strong. She sees that her profits are good. Her lamp never goes out at night. She extends her hands to the spinning staff and her hands hold the spindle. Her hands reach out to the poor. She extends her hands to the needy. She's not afraid for her household when it snows, for all in her household are doubly clothed. She makes her own bed clothings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the city gates where he sits among the elders of the land. She makes and sells linen garments. She delivers belts to the merchants. Strength and honour are her clothing. And she can laugh at the time to come. Her mouth speaks wisdom and loving instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the activities of her household and is never idle. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also praises her. 
Many women have done noble deeds, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. Give her the reward of her labor. Let her works praise her at the city gates. That woman is awesome. She's amazing. And she's the model that the Bible holds up to us. Women of village, look at her. Aspire to be like her. And you know what? Actually, many of you are. There are lots of women in this church who are examples of this woman described in Proverbs 31. Just get this. The Bible's ideal woman is 180 degrees opposite to the portrayal of the handmaid tale. You, you see that, don't you? It's 180 degrees opposite. That is such a wicked, horrible, despicable lie. What about fathers? Well, there's a little verse tucked away in Ephesians 3 that I want to show you. Ephesians 3, verse 14. Paul's beginning a prayer. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Now, you wouldn't notice this in the Holman. You wouldn't notice it in the NIV. But the word there that is family... It's actually, the Greek word is patria. I mean, the author could have used oikos or household. But I'm persuaded there's something significant in the idea that he uses the word patria here, the word for family here, that comes from the word patre or father, from which we get the, name, the title pat patriarchy. I read uh, about this from the number of commentators, but here's one from the 10th century commentator, Theophylact. He says, every family or patria and lineage proceeds from the father, patre. The generations of people on earth he calls families because they're named after the founding fathers of their lineages. And the idea that you would call a family unit Patria is the idea, what is a family? Well, it's a group headed by a father. It derives its name from father as the root meaning of the word. So men, fathers, husbands, I don't think the Bible just, I mean, the Bible clearly sees it as your task to lovingly tenderly serve your wife by seeing her holy and blameless on the last day particularly but also the commission to you is to lovingly tenderly serve your children your family by seeing them holy and blameless let me give it to you from a specific instruction from Ephesians 6 just three chapters later fathers Ephesians 6 verse 4 Fathers, don't provoke, your ch don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, and I just want to underline this to the men here, it's your job to bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I spoke a moment ago very positively, aspirationally, about the Bible's role for women, for mothers, in families. I just want to speak positively, aspirationally, enthusiastically about the aspirational role for fathers. Because I'm, I'm troubled that in our society there's very little positive encouragement to men and fathers at the moment. 
about the distinctive responsibilities of fathers. You men, you do bring something to the family that mothers don't. Just as mothers bring something to the family that fathers don't. So I want to say to the man, be a man. Be a husband. Be a father. Embrace that role. He's given you, obviously, a specific responsibility. Present your wife holy and blameless on the last day. But he's given you a special responsibility, Father, to bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is not something to outsource. Yeah, mum's there to help. There are kids' leaders. I mean, awesome. 22 kids and youth leaders in this church. Probably our biggest number ever. Fantastic. Actually, in the 1950s, there were 300 kids in the Sunday school. So probably there were more kids and youth leaders then, but biggest number in recent times. Stacks of youth. The youth group this year is going to be amazing on Friday night and Sunday afternoon. It's just, we've been having headache after headache about how to set things up, but it's just, they're fantastic problems to have because it's going to be brilliant. Anyway, you can't outsource it, dads. It's your job. Your responsibility. You ought to own it. And women, just as the man is to embrace his responsibility, his distinct responsibility, you ought to embrace your responsibility, your distinct responsibility. God has given you specific, beautiful, complementary responsibilities to complement, to help, not rival your fellow gardener. So what do I think is the answer to the question? Does the Bible reflect a patriarchal bias? Or does God value women and men equally? Well, I actually don't like the question. Because it assumes the answer's got to be one or the other. Certainly, God values men and women equally. Can't be the second. But I don't think it's the first either. Because God does give complementary responsibilities to men and women. God does not treat men and women the same. But I don't think giving a differing responsibility means one is valued less or more. I say it's different. Gardening to husbands, helping task to wife. There is in the Bible an overall responsibility to care for, serve and nurture the family that the husband father has and the wife is to support and encourage him, help him in that task. That as he says, I will do everything I can to love you, everything I can to serve you, everything I can to put your interests first in every way, specifically to present you holy and blameless before God. And she says, well, that's lovely and thank you and given that's your position, I'll follow you wherever you would have me go. It's the picture of sacrificial service from the husband and trust from the wife. Now, you're probably thinking that sounds too good to be true. Um, thinking, that's really, really nice. Really, really good. It is worth noting though, something disastrously, tragically goes wrong. This ideal picture of husband loving and wife helping is catastrophically fractured in Genesis 3. Our first parents reject God. There's a judgment in response to punishment. Their relationship ends up being marred by conflict and Adam turns into a brute and Eve starts to compete, to control, to desire to master her husband. They're both terrible and so far from the creation ideal that God had for them just one page earlier. And the end point is tension in the marriage, sometimes even spilling out all the way to the tragedy of abuse. They're just 
we're deep enough in this, I need to say this. Abuse, domestic violence, that's not God's intention. That's not what he wants for you. It's not what I want for you. It's not what this church wants for you. If you want it, I, I, I encourage you to go and look. If you go to villagechurch.sydney slash domestic violence, that's our page outlining our policy on this domestic violence. I'd encourage you to read it. And we treated this as an important subject and we did a special presentation on it a little while back. And um, I'd encourage you to read it and to talk to somebody. Uh, I don't want you to stay in that situation if that's an issue for you. But I come back to us today, marriages, relationships, men, women, husbands, wives. And I was set a question. I tried to answer the question I was set. I hope you've seen that the Handmaid's Tale picture is the very antithesis of the position of this church, the very antithesis of the position of God. But I hope you've also seen just a tinsy glimpse of the beautiful pattern of relationships that God does advocate, of husbands lovingly serving and of wives trusting and respecting, modelled on Jesus. I, I, I was interviewed a while ago by a reporter, a religion reporter from the Sydney Morning Herald. It was such a long time ago, it was when the Herald had a religion round. Um, and she was aggressively asking me all these gender questions. And it was really quite, I mean, it was, it was as if I was responsible for everything that all men had ever done wrong. And um, I had to ask her after a while to stop the recording. And in the privacy of not being recorded, I, I tried to say, look, this picture that you're kind of caricaturing, just attacking me on, that's not my marriage. And I shared with her what was going on in our marriage and talked about how I was trying to care for Catherine, how I was trying to love her, how I, was trying to, how I thought about the kids, how I was trying to serve her, how, I was, how we would struggle when we were both tired, but how sometimes we got it right and how the, we were trying to do things better that the, that the role of the husband wasn't about lording over, wasn't about insisting on rights, but that the role of the husband was about sacrificial service and laying down life and modelled on Jesus' sacrificial service. And, and actually, the responsibility for a husband is when you've given your all, when, you, when you've died for your wife, you've just done what was expected of you. You've just followed the example that was shown to you. And for her, it was a Copernican revolution. The idea that a man would not be about power, but would be about service. And that a woman would not be about grasping for power. That there was a possibility of a loving complementary relationship but, but I just say the only way you could even begin to get that is by looking at Jesus this one who laid down his life for us now um, that's actually what this whole church is about that's the, it's the whole of what this church is about um this Tuesday night, uh, here we start an Introducing God course. Um, I think there's about 20 people who've signed up to do the course. Uh, but it's not too late for you to join. And the whole thing in the end is about understanding God's love for us in Jesus. This sacrificial love that God extends to us in Christ Jesus.